Howdy Leadership Scholars and welcome back to ALEC 618. We are still in the performing module as we continue to talk about what is going to probably occur when you are in the thick of it, right? When you actually get to do the thing. So one of the things that I wanted to focus on is problem solving. And you'll see in, in a minute why this is going to be a concept that is going to span all of your different stages of Tuckman, but within the performance stage, it is imperative to really have a good system in place on how you are going to solve problems. So let's talk about this. You have a natural tendency to solve problems. You may be a quick thinker, right? You make a decision quickly, you make it, you move on. You may be a muller. You may mull over the decision. You may think about the problem maybe too much, right? If that's your, if that's kind of your cup of tea, I understand that. So how you solve problems has actually, based on research, been connected to your personality typology. So let's dust off that old good old Myers-Briggs and talk about this. So how you gather information as your, um, your temperament, right, comes in two forms, sensation or intuitive. Are you an S or an I? And looking at that, sensation people prefer routine, right? So a problem to them might be that something is out of order, that the routine is not occurring, that the plan is not going as planned, okay? That could really so kind of make them say, all right, we are in crisis mode. We got to solve this problem. Those that rely on sensation, again, that's those five senses. They like detail, right? So how do they solve problems? They want all the information. Go back to your group member roles, right? These are our information seekers. We want the facts. Intuitive, so if intuitive is one of your personality traits, according to Myers-Briggs, they're better at seeing the big picture so they don't get focused on the trees, they see the forest. So a problem they see from, I guess, a 30,000 foot view, right? Not in the thick of it. So they have a different perspective, which leads them to maybe dislike routine. Um, they're okay with things getting switched up. So if something doesn't go to plan, they don't freak out. They're just like, hey, didn't work out. Let's solve this problem and go, right? It's not that big of a deal for them. And it opens a lot of possibilities. They're okay with different possibilities because they go with their gut. Now, this also works for evaluation when we are solving problems. So that feeling versus thinking, those that have feeling in their personality, that sounds terrible. <laughs> like if you don't, then you're not a good human. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you're an F or a T. Um, when it comes to problems, they're going to seek conformity. So what are the rules that are already there? How can we make sure it's equitable for everyone? Um, how can we make sure that this makes sense in everyone's perspective? They sometimes accommodate themselves to others. So during the problem, if someone identifies a maybe a, maybe a solution that they don't 100% agree with, they're willing to maybe go along to get along. So we're bringing in storming again, right? They're like, mm, yeah, okay, I can go. I, I, I can go with that because they don't like disagreements. So if we're connecting all this stuff, which now you are, right? You're in the fourth phase of, of the team is going back and saying, yeah, all right, that makes a lot of sense because if that's your group member role, if this is what you do, if you're a, a harmonious, cohesive type person, then you're gonna love the norming stage, right? Because that's your sweet spot. So when we have a problem, that takes you out of that sweet spot of norming. And then thinking. So if you are a thinker, if T is one of your letters in Myers-Briggs, again, you use reason and intellect, facts, logic, does it make sense? Have we experienced this before? It is not an emotional reaction to the problem of crisis panic, which sometimes happens with feeling. It's, all right, this is happening. Now let's analyze the process. That makes sense. So problems. We know it's easier on a lot of, in a lot of ways and on a lot of scales to handle a problem by ourselves. 
But what are some advantages of using a team? There are advantages, I promise. You get that shared knowledge and experience, right? So when we talk about through our readings of that cognitive diversity that we have that can be such an asset for team, but is also a giant pain in the hiney, um, it can help you because someone may have had an experience that you didn't with this problem in the past, and they may be able to solve it in a way you never would have thought about. So it allows that person to share their experiences, but probably gain a better example of what should happen moving forward. It leads to better understanding of how and why a decision was made. So we talked about decision making, right? We talked about all the sorts of different models and things that you can do to make decisions as a team. But I love this is that when it's done together, people are actually going to take their medicine. Does that make sense? Yes, it empowers them, but also it gets buy in. So when everyone has a voice on how the problem is solved, they're more likely to be active proponents of solving that problem, even if it turns south. They can say, hey, this was our reasoning. This is why we did it. These are the things that make it important to us. This is why we thought it would succeed. So they have buy-in. And members are willing to take more risks because we're all in this together. A little high school musical, right? So when you have that team bond, when you have formed, when you've gone through the storming phase, when you are a cohesive unit, you are going to take risks and you're also going to know that almost all of the, the foreseen consequences and unseen consequences have probably been accounted for because you have that diversity of thought. And you can talk about if you believe something is way too risky, um, maybe you're not a risk taker, then someone who is can kind of help you see their point of view and that might move you. Maybe one tick to the middle, but at least it's one step in that direction. Now, this isn't always, so I, I never say always, usually collective judgment is better than that of an individual. Now we talk about groupthink, we talk about the road to Abilene, we talk about um, the ubiquitous they, you know, who told you to do that? Well, they said it was great. Oh, who's they? Um, so sometimes that becomes problematic, right? If the moral majority isn't actually doing what is the collective best, um, but it's usually better than that of an individual. But there are some limitations, right, of using a team for problem solving. Ah, when you're in the norming phase, right, that pressure to conform may negatively influence your ability to say your truth. And that could be also within the storming stage. If you have a dominator, if one person is dominating the group, it's going to not be fruitful to try to engage people in that process. You know, looking at case studies, looking at what's going on in the world, um, we've seen this, right? When one person is dominating and they make other people feel like they can't contribute. So it's not even team then. A group requires more time to reach a decision than individuals do. This is usually the biggest limitation when I do team development for corporate uh, partners as well as with student organizations. I say, what are the good things about working in the team and what are the bad things about working in the team? And it doesn't matter what the setting is, time is always listed as a negative. It takes time. When you get people together to make a decision to solve a problem, it's going to take time. It's not quick if you do it right, right? If you're building consensus and all that fun stuff. So groups generally don't make better decisions than an expert. So that's how it's a little different from that first slide that talked about, you know, teams make better um, decisions than individuals, comma, except when there is an expert that says, no, I, I've lived this, I've studied this, I've done this, this is not true. So let me tell you a quick story about this. Um, I was doing a corporate training with Halliburton. They have this amazing leadership um, program within the Halliburton oil and gas system. And it had executives or mid-level executives from across the world, 
in this training and we were doing teams. And so I have this really fun activity and we talk about consensus where you are stuck in the Arctic and you only have like 11 items to help you uh, survive and try to get back to your base camp and you have to rank them. And so the first thing you do is you rank them as an individual and then you get into your team and you work together to rank them again. What's so cool about that, that activity is that it shows this idea of problem solving when it's just a collective mind versus when an expert is there. So one of the things that you have at your disposal is a flashlight. And in this group, and not to throw gender dynamics, but I think that it probably has something to do with this. You, I had a, a group of four men and one woman, and they all talked about how the flashlight was essential. And she said, you know, it's not. And they said, oh yeah, you've got to have it survive. You, you know, what if it's dark and a polar bear comes? And she's like, yeah, you really don't. I, I, I know you don't. And she wasn't communicating why she knew it. She wasn't communicating very well, honestly, that she was the expert, but they completely shut her down. Like they told her she was dumb. And then it came to this other thing, which was a roll of film. Heck, some of you guys have probably never even seen a roll of film in real life. Um, but when cameras were, weren't digital, and she said, actually, that can be useful in a lot of different ways. And so she gave a couple of examples of how that film could be useful, burning it and uh, wearing it for sunglasses and things like that. And they just thought, I mean, you should have seen the body language. Like they leaned back, um, they crossed their arms. They were just not into what she was saying at all. Well, turns out she is an expert. The reason why she was an expert is because she was from Greenland. She had lived close to the Arctic. She understood that at that time of year when this survivalist thing was taking place, it was almost 24 hours worth of daylight. The flashlight would have been worthless, but they didn't listen to her. So their team ended up losing, which, you know, as a facilitator, this was just gold. So I was like, tell me, tell me about this uh, flashlight. This really seemed to be the thing because it's almost dead last in your list and they had ranked it first. And they, the men hemmed and hawed. And finally I looked at this woman and I said, I would like to hear your perspective on what happened. And she said, they didn't listen to me. And I said, they didn't. I was, I was walking around. I heard that. Um, can you tell them why? You never vocalized why the flashlight wasn't important. Can you tell them why you know that? And that's when she's like, I'm originally from Greenland. I know this, I've experienced this. And boy, those men just shrank, right? Because they had an expert in the mint, in their midst, but they weren't willing to actually listen to the expert. So anyways, it's a very cool activity. Let me know um, if you're interested, I'll get you the details. It's a very cool one. So there's some different approaches to problem solving. That's kind of what I wanted to highlight um, here. We're gonna just cop talk about a couple. Um, and first, I think this was really interesting is in those kind of beginning stages, the forming and the storming, first thing you've gotta do is actually determine the nature of how your team assignment, your team project, your, whatever the details are, you've got to figure out what's truly going on. What is your boss actually trying to get you guys to do together? Is there a, a specific timeline? Is there, um, are there some maybe expectations for evaluation that you don't know? So this is imperative when we talk about problem solving, you gotta define the problem, what is actually going on? So discussing this, documenting this, so using some of that like nominal group technique and things that we talked about in one of the earlier lectures, evaluating everyone's point of view. So if you have talked about group member roles, right? You formed, you know your teammate as actual humans, then you can say, oh, I bet I can't remember that was this woman's name. I wish I could. Sally, let's call her Sally. I bet Sally has a really interesting perspective on the Arctic because she's from Greenland, right? But they hadn't even taken the time to know each other. So they didn't even know that about her. Challenge all those preconceived notions. So you know what you do when you assume. So this allows you to challenge those why, ask why this is critical thinking that we got going on here. Defining what success is for ourselves. Not only for, you know, what is it that I believe, 
um, but what is it do, that we collectively believe is success with this project and how are we going to evaluate our success? Now, the reason why I have problem solving in storming is because of this. Managing problems and obstacles. When the problem arises, okay, and in the performance stage, it will happen. Nothing goes to plan perfectly. Nothing. The best made plans. If you want to hear God laugh, tell them your plans. All those colloquialisms that we have, we know as humans that there are so many things that we can't account for that problems will happen. And what do they stem from? Sometimes it's because you didn't do this problem solving step before, which is really defining what's actually going on. What is the root cause? And these kind of, I call them crisis problems. So things that spring up out of nowhere or seemingly out of nowhere, they can be technical, they can be procedural, like something's going on with the system or straight up people problems. And so sometimes it's not a storming issue because not everyone's involved. It's a problem between two people, which makes it a little different than storming. So I love this one. This is the rational problem solving model. This is just about as easy as you get, y'all. I love that it's the rational problem solving model. First, you define the problem or you identify the problem. <laughs> I have a problem. Um, identifying the problem is the first thing. Then the next thing is looking at what are our decision criteria that we're looking for. And then we weigh the decision criteria. So what's more important, X or Y? If we decide Y is more important, then we start generating alternatives to solving this problem. We evaluate all of those alternatives. Which one do we think is best out of this list? And then we select that best alternative. And it goes hand in hand with decision making. It goes hand in hand with what we talked about with project management, with those different brainstorming and nominal group techniques. And so you see how this is all coming together in this great. So selecting that best alternative. If you look at this too, I think it should go back to evaluate alternatives. If after you select the best alternative, it doesn't go right. Okay, let's go back to our list and let's do this again. Now we have the design approach to problem solving. That's different than maybe the design approach to uh, teaching that's been kind of hot here lately. Um, but the design approach to problem solving is just straight up Tuckman. I love this. So what it says first is what we call forming, but you have to examine the task and the assignment. You've got to better understand that bigger picture of what's truly going on. And you set up that decision for communication decision-making. How are we going to do this? And to me, that's all forming. The next part of this problem solving, design approach to problem solving is understanding that everyone's going to have their own opinion. Okay. There's different definitions of the problem that could cause some conflict. Um, preliminary uh, solutions are discussed, which can also call, cause conflict. If you're a thinker and somebody else is a feeler, right? We just talked about that. And sometimes this happens and causes conflict because we jump ahead to solutions before the problem is even defined. One of the activities that we do with our undergraduates, and I love this activity, it's called toxic waste. And we have them, it's a can, an old coffee can full of water with a circle around it in caution tape. And we tell them as a team, they've got to figure out how to remove the toxic waste or the water in the coffee can out of the circle without going into the circle and anything that goes into the circle becomes toxic waste and you can't use it anymore. And inevitably, every single time we've done this activity and we have done this activity, goodness, for a couple of decades on and off, is that people pick things up. So we have rope, we've got inner tube tires, we have um, hula hoops, we have all sorts of things out there, mostly as a distraction. Um, but everyone feels like they have to be holding something, right? I wanna feel useful. I wanna help solve the problem before they've even figured out what is the actual problem? Is it, we've gotta figure out how to 
how to move the coffee can or do we dump the coffee can? Like, what do we do? And so they just jump ahead and we do this all the time, right? We want to be useful. We want to think about solutions before even the problem is sometimes defined. So looking at design approach two, um, kind of the next thing comes is norming, which is interesting. So you follow the system made that you set up for communication and design. And then within the performing, when there is a crisis, when there is a problem, this can happen again with task or relationship. So then you go back to that system. How do you deal with this? So the reason why I have these pictures, you may be like, okay, Jen, what is this? Um, I think I told you guys, oh goodness, I can't even remember what stories I've told. That's terrible. Um, when I was a faculty member at the University of Georgia, one of my first charges was to take a team of undergraduates to the former Soviet Republic of Georgia and conduct a youth leadership program. Basically, it was the FFA program taken to Georgia, so it was called the FFG. Um, so when it came to problems, I didn't realize, because I was green as a gourd, I mean, brand new faculty member, I didn't realize how many problems we would have. Um, I did know Tuckman, and so I was very cognizant of us going through all the stages of Tuckman. But when we were in that forming stage, our first big problem that we had was that we did not realize, we developed all this curriculum, we did it to um, Dr. Seuss um, and the, oh my gosh, Brenna got like three of these for graduation. Why can I not think of this? Oh, the roads, oh, oh the roads you'll go. Oh. You know what I'm talking about. Anyways, it was all themed to that Dr. Seuss book, um, which was great, except for when you translate Dr. Seuss into a foreign language, which is Georgian, um, it doesn't rhyme and it's dumb. <laughs> and so that was our first big problem is that we didn't have that big picture of, hey, when you translate this stuff, this is going to be problematic. So we had to, oh, the places you'll go. There it is. Holy moly. All right. So we had to scrap that and completely start again. We had to understand the bigger picture better. We had some... Uh, preliminary problems and, and, and solutions. All right, so when that happened, we fixed that problem. Something else came up, which was we had planned on using, and you can see in the right-hand picture there um, at the bottom, it's hard to see because it's small. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, it are giant post-its, right? I tell people all the time, I'm a leadership educator. Give me some giant post-it smelly markers and hula hoops, and I can teach for days. Um, but we had had activities planned on giant post-its. Again, not understanding the bigger picture um, and, and not understanding that we jumped ahead to solutions of, oh, well, we're not going to have the ability to have worksheets. We'll just put it on this giant post-it. Not realizing that we would have to figure out how to get our giant post-its to Georgia because they did not have that at the time. And we did not write Georgian. So we had to make sure that our translators would write everything that we needed on this. I mean, it was just a comedy of errors. So many problems. So at that point, me as the, you know, adult in the room, the faculty member said, all right, we need a better way to communicate. We need a better way to make decisions because these things are going to come up and we're not going to realize, you know, I knew that once we got to Georgia, there would be more problems. I didn't know what those problems were, but I knew there'd be more problems. And the one that got us was that about every uh, 45 minutes, we had to take a break. Because in their culture, the high school kids, because we were talking to high school kids, they smoke, right? Okay, the ethnocentrism uh, came out in all of us very quickly. We're like, they should not be doing that. But we had to reel ourselves back for a second. But we did not realize that every 45 minutes, they would need a smoke break. So if you take a group of, I think we had about 40 high school kids um, every 15 or every 45 minutes having to stop so some of them could smoke. We were also by the beach um, in Batumi and so some of them would run to the water and like jump in full clothed. Um, we had to figure out quickly, we had the problem of how do we get them back into the classroom without us standing and going, yo, get back in here, um, which came in the form of I like to move it, move it. 
I don't know how that occurred, but it did. They loved that song. And then the other problem was when we were taking so many breaks because that 45 minute you know, breaking every 45 minutes for at least 15 minutes, because that's how long it would take us to round these children back up. That significantly cut into our teaching time. So at the end of the first night, our big crisis was, we got to cut two modules. What do we cut? And it was a big thing. And it became a task oriented, but then it switched into relationship because it just happened to be that the two that we decided to cut were two that one particular student was lead on. And it wasn't about her, but she felt like it was about her. And so it became then a relationship um, crisis that we had to solve um, so that she would be a, a functioning team member again. So I saw this in action, right? How problem solving and Tuckman absolutely go hand in hand. And so you could go through like a mini version of Tuckman when you're trying to solve problems. That's kind of the basis of this. Now, we talk about there are certain teams that are just problem solving teams, which I think is really interesting, right? They are usually established for brief periods to solve specific organizational problems or to encourage organizational improvement. Um, so you may have been a member of a problem solving team. You may decide in your leadership role that you need to implement a problem solving team. So these problem solving teams need to be able to have that systematic approach, whether they take you know whichever design method or rational method that they utilize. Um, but it's really important as they move through, um, they could do problem analysis. Uh, there's a thing called criteria matrices. Um, they could do an action plan, which is great for after action plans, which we'll, we'll talk about uh, in the adjourning stage. There's a cool thing called force field analysis if you're interested you can get into that. So problems will happen. Problems will absolutely happen during performing. So how are you going to approach the problem? Good communication skills, working together, your team will benefit. Whew. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.